Welcome to the second session of the lecture in SQL databases. We will cover graph databases today. This lecture is based on my book Advanced Data Management, where you can find more information on the topics. We will start with some basics of graph theory. First of all, let us look at how a graph is defined in mathematics. A graph consists of a set of nodes or vertices called V and a set of edges called E so that the entire graph is a tuple of the node set V and the edge set E. An edge is a link between two nodes. An edge can either be undirected or it can have a direction which is denoted by an arrow tip. Here we see an example of an undirected graph. A graph is called undirected if it only has undirected edges. Here we see an example of a directed graph or digraph for short. It only has directed edges. We will also consider the case of a multigraph. This means there can be more than one edge between any pair of nodes. We now come to the two central terms of adjacency between a pair of nodes and incidence between a node and an edge. Two nodes are called adjacent if they are neighbors, that is, there's an edge between them. An edge is incident to a node if it is actually connected to the node. For directed edges, we have to differentiate between positive incidence and negative incidence. A directed edge is positively incident to its source node and negatively incident to its target node. We also say that a node is incident to an edge if it is connected to the edge. An advantage of the graph data structure is that we can easily traverse it. Traversal is done by following so-called path. A path is a serial concatenation of edges. That is, the end vertex of one edge is the start vertex of the next edge on the path. Here we see an example of a path. Starting from the node Alice, it computes all the friends of Alice's friends. To do so, it traverses the edges labeled nodes. If we store paths as intermediate results, we can later on use them as normal edges too. Graph traversal has also been analyzed in graph theory. For example, when we want to visit all nodes in a graph, which is actually the best order to do so. The two major methods are breadth-first search and depth-first search. Graphs can also be traversed with graph algorithms like shortest path. Moreover, several graph problems have been analyzed in theory. For some of them, implementations are available in graph databases too. Now we come to the topic of using graphs for data storage. Graphs as a data structure are usually helpful when the links between data items are important and the links can also carry information on their own. One example for this are social networks. In a social network, nodes can represent persons that do have certain properties like name or age. In the social network, nodes are connected by edges. An edge qualifies the relationship between two persons. As a second example, in a geographic information system, nodes can represent cities. Cities can have certain properties like a name and a population count. An edge between two cities can specify the distance between the cities. We will now introduce the property graph model, which is often used in graph databases. A property graph is a directed multigraph. Some graph databases support multi-value properties. That is, we still have one string as a key, but the value part of the property can be a list or an array of values. A predefined key called ID is usually used to uniquely identify vertices and edges. Optionally, we can introduce types and labels in the property graph model. Without typing, vertices and edges can store arbitrary key value pairs. By typing, I can introduce a schema for nodes and edges. By doing so, I can also define different semantics for different types of nodes and edges. For vertices, we can use a predefined property key called type. For example, for a person type, we can pre prescribe which properties are allowed or necessary for persons. 
For edges, the property key used for typing is often called a label. We can optionally specify which edge label is allowed between which vertex types. Duplicate edge labels between two nodes are usually unnecessary. That is why multi-edges are only allowed when edge labels are different. The next topic we will cover is graph storage. How can one efficiently store a graph structure? The main problem is finding a good representation for edges. There is an inherent trade-off between quick storage and good runtime behavior, for example for graph traversals. As the simplest option, we can store the vertex set V and separately the edge set E. The advantage of this data structure is that we can quickly insert edges and vertices, and we don't have any storage overhead. The disadvantage is that we have problems at runtime. Determining all adjacent vertices and checking the existence of an edge between two nodes requires scanning the entire set E. We will next look at several options to store graphs with a better runtime behavior. The first option is the adjacency matrix. For n nodes, the adjacency matrix is an n times n matrix. The rows and columns denote the vertices. If there are no edges, the matrix contains only zeros. If there is an undirected edge between two nodes, we flip the bits for the rows and columns of the nodes. For the edge E1 between V1 and V2, we have the bit set where V1 is the row and V2 is the column, and we have the bit set where, where V2 is the row and V1 is the column. That is, the matrix is symmetric and each edge is represented twice in the matrix. We can also represent loops, that is, edges on one node. In this case, we could write 2 in the appropriate matrix cell on the diagonal. For a directed graph, the adjacency matrix is no longer symmetric. For example, we can let the source node be represented by the column and the target node be represented by the row. That is, for edge E1, we set the bit 1 where V1 is the column and V2 is the row because V1 is the source node and V2 is the target node of E1. For loops on one node, we can now simply write the one bit in the appropriate matrix cell on the diagonal. For multigraphs, we can count the number of edges between any pair of nodes. In case of an undirected graph, again, the matrix is symmetric. In our example graph, we have two nodes between V1 and V3. That is, we have to write a 2 in the matrix where V1 is the column and V3 is the row, and a 2 where V3 is the column and V1 is the row. We can also count the loops, but then we write twice the amount into the appropriate matrix cell on the diagonal. The adjacency matrix for a directed multigraph is again asymmetric. In our example graph, we just write the 2 where V1 is the column and V3 is the row because there are two directed edges starting from V1 and going to V3. For loops, we only write the simple count, for example k, into the appropriate matrix cell on the diagonal. We now come to the advantages and disadvantages of adjacency matrices. From a runtime perspective, we can now quickly, quickly look up the existence of a single edge. And for existing nodes, we can quickly insert a new edge by just swapping the bit in the matrix cell. However, there are also several disadvantages. For one, the matrix is very storage intensive. Moreover, if I have many vertices but few edges, the matrix is sparse, that is, I have lots of zeros in the matrix. Then, determining all adjacent vertices for one vertex requires looking up the entire row. We cannot store hyperedges between two nodes, and the insertion of a new vertex is costly because I have to add a new row and a new column. The next storage option we want to look at is the incidence matrix. The rows now denote the vertices, whereas the columns denote the edges. 
That is, if I have n nodes and m edges, the incidence matrix is an n times m matrix. If the graph doesn't have any edges, the matrix contains no columns. For an undirected graph, we write one bits for those rows representing those nodes that are incident to the edge. In our example graph, the edge E1 is incident to V1 and V2, so that's why the two bits are set for the column E1. Loops can, for example, be represented by writing a 2 for the column representing the loop edge and the row representing the node to which the loop edge is incident. Moving over to directed graphs, we now have to represent which node is actually the source node and which node is the target node of an edge. That is why we encode the source node by minus 1 and the target node by 1 in the incidence matrix for a directed graph. In our example graph, V1 is the source node for edge E1 and V2 is the target node for edge E1. When representing loops, we still write 2 for the column representing the loop edge and the row denoting the node to which the loop edge is incident. Coming to multigraphs, we see that there is no difference between a simple graph and a multigraph because now the edges have their own columns. The same applies if we have a directed multigraph. It is treated the same as a directed simple graph. The incidence matrix has the advantage that only existing edges are stored. That is, we don't have any columns with only zeros. Moreover, hyperedges can be stored by giving them their separate edge column. However, the incidence matrix has several disadvantages. As the adjacency matrix, the incidence matrix is also quite storage intensive. If we have many vertices, we also have lots of zeros in the columns, if not all edges between nodes are present. If we want to determine all adjacent vertices for one vertex, we first have to look up for the ones in the entire row, and then we have to look up for one entries in the columns for the appropriate adjacent vertices. Insertion of a new vertex requires adding an entire new row, and insertion of a new edge requires adding an entire column, which is again costly. The next storage structure we look at is the adjacency list. First of all, we store the entire vertex set V, and for each vertex we store a list of its adjacent vertices. For an undirected graph, we store all neighboring vertices for one node in its, adja in its adjacency list. However, for an undirected graph, we store only for those edges for which the node is the source node, the list of all the target nodes of the edge. For multigraphs, we allow nodes to appear multiple times in the adjacency list of a node. For example, V3 appears twice in the adjacency list of V1 because there are two edges between V1 and V3. The adjacency list has several advantages. We can quickly lo look up all adjacent vertices of one vertex by just giving out its adjacency list. We don't have any storage overhead. Only relevant information is stored. That is, an edge is only represented if, it's, if it exists. We can also quickly insert a new vertex by just adding it to the vertex set. And we can quickly insert a new edge by appending it to the appropriate adjacency lists. Hyperedges can also be stored. A slight extension would be necessary by, for example, storing a set of vertices comprising the hyperedge in the adjacency list. One disadvantage of the adjacency list is that when we want to check for the existence of a single edge, we are required to traverse the entire adjacency list. The last option for graph storage is the incidence list. 
again we store the vertex set V. For each vertex we store then a list of all its incident edges. In the case of a directed graph we only store incidence lists for the source nodes of the edges. For multigraphs, because edges have an identity of their own, they simply appear in the incidence list. The same applies in case of a directed multigraph. As a last topic for this session, we will look at some graph databases and APIs. The Tinkerpop graph processing stack is kind of a de facto standard for graph databases and graph processing nowadays. In the example you can see how to construct a new graph in Java and add vertices and edges to it. To represent a graph traversal, method chaining is used so that you can concatenate several method calls to achieve a final traversal of the graph. In the example we see that all nodes with a name property set to Alice are looked up. Then all edges labeled nodes are followed. From the target nodes, all values of the name property are returned. So here we print out all names of Alice's friends. Neo4j is a popular open source graph database. It has a declarative query language called Cypher. With Cypher you can express graph traversals from a set of start starting nodes in the graph. The main syntax elements of Cypher are the start directive, the match directive, the where condition and the return statement. In the example you can see how a starting node named Alice is looked up in an index. In the match directive we see that from the starting node we follow the nose edge to another person. This person is then returned as the output. So the example returns us all friends of Alice by going along the nose edges. Other open source databases like OrientDB and ArangoDB also offer graph APIs and they also offer extensions of their query languages to handle and express graph queries. For the semantic web there exist several specialized graph databases. These are the so-called triple stores for the resource description framework. Examples are Aligo Graph and Gina. If you need a more advanced data model, like for example a directed hypergraph, where a graph may contain hyperedges that combine two, more than two nodes, there is also a specialized database called HypergraphDB. Several systems are also available for pure graph processing rather than graph storage. They usually apply bulk synchronous parallel processing, a model proposed by Leslie Valiant. Following Google's Priggle system, several open source systems have appeared. Some of them are Apache Hama, Apache Giraffe and GraphX for Apache Spark. This was the session on graph databases and graph management. Thank you for listening.